and the needle. And in that verse, it basically says, uh, uh, for the one who's puffed up, who's vain, who's full of himself, <clears throat> heaven will not open, and he will not, or she will not, enter into paradise until the camel goes through the eye of the needle. However, let's keep that in mind, the one who is puffed up. And then now we'll look, of course, at those of us raised in <coughs> catechism and so forth. Um, I mean, this is the one I always like to visualize on the camel and the needle. Matthew 19, huh? I tell you the truth. It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because a rich young man had come to Jesus. Peace be upon him. On Jesus, that is. And, um, and it said, um, uh, how, can I, how can I make it to paradise? And he said, well, um, you can do good works. And you can give up all of your wealth to the poor. And he said, well, I, I, I just can't do that. And, um, and this, is, this is what Jesus says to him. See, I tell you the truth. It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, well, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now, Rumi would have been very aware, because we see in the Masnavi constant references to Christian doctrine, he would have been fully aware of the Christian tradition and the use of this in Matthew and in the Synoptic Gospels. But he's actually, when Rumi does this, we have to always, we must never underestimate, uh, even, even when he's being, when he's playing around and and, and joking with us and so forth, which here he is not. Um, but we must always assume that there, there may be something special going on here, something to this. Now in both cases, what we have is, is the idea of something that has to be given up. And in the first one we find out that the person's puffed up, they're vain, they're full of themselves they might perhaps be a little bit like the fellow who was knocking on the door in the earlier poem. In other words, they, they, they don't realize that there's not room. <clears throat> See, there's, there's no room under the blankets for me and you. There's only room for love under the blankets. Huh? So this is, this is one side of it. But the other side, uh, Rumi would have very much liked the Christian version of this, and the reason is very simple, which is that it, it allows him to reference a famous saying by the Prophet Muhammad, which is that normally it's, it's translated as, poverty is my glory. But really, you could translate it as um, uh, indigence, is my excellence, or poverty is my excellence. Or you could translate it as indigence, or poverty is my exaltation. And this phrase, when we read the Islamic literature, the literalist literature, we find many, many, we find a number of, we find a number of citations where, like in the, the story of Jesus, the person is, is, is uh, advised to give up their wealth. And there are stories that are quoted, and there are stories in the Sufi tradition, and there are other stories in the Masnavi along these lines. On the other hand, in the Masnavi and elsewhere, there is a thorough explanation and exploration of, of the true meaning of faqr, poverty. And, and the, the true meaning of it brings us back to the theme of the impersonal existentialist, 
to be, to be so poor that you've given up uh, everything that you know, including everything that you know about yourself. And in fact, uh, it may be the reason why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, needed to be illiterate. Because to be literate might, might get in the way of revelation. So we're, we're introduced again to this principle, and now we can, we can explore it. Um, we'll, we'll turn to, to Shabastari. Uh, Mahmoud Shabastari um, lived in, in Tabriz during the Ilhanid period, and in 1317 he's writing this, this book, which, which one version is my own translation, which if anyone wants to get copies, it's available here. There are other fine translations of it. And Shabbos story um, is um, interesting because Rumi lives at the same time as the greatest sheikh Ibn al-Arabi of Spain, who really um, is the one who establishes various branches of the school of existentialism in the Islamic world. But, but Rumi, um, although he knows Ibn al-Arabi's disciple, Kunyavi, he's not particularly drawn to that language in and of itself, whereas Ibn al-Arabi is actually going to use existential language, and therefore his followers, such as Shabastari, are also going to use that language. They're going to state this in, in, in existential terms. And, and as I said to you, uh, there's, there's one reason for this, is that unfortunately, um, they realize that narrow-mindedness in religion and habit, and habit uh, worship, habitual worship, that the, the methodology was not working properly. It should have been enough to bring people into direct experiential awareness and understanding of the truths in the Quran, but with the accretion of centuries of overlaid teaching, superstitions, um, local folkloric uh, values, etc., they found that they needed to use other language without abandoning the religious language. Right alongside the religious language they were presenting both the language of love and the language of existentialism and other, and other uh, kinds of communication. So they had to be flexible to break through the barriers, the blindness that they encountered. And Shabastari is, um, has many commentators and, and, and I think the, the one book that I, I have seen even more than in Ibn al-Arabi's works, there's, it's more densely packed with existential terminology, is the, the Mafati Ali Josfi Shari Gulshan Eroz of Muhammad Lahiji, uh, the, the, um, the inimitable eloquence in the elucidation of the Garden of Mystery. And it is just so, it is just so from start to finish, packed with, with, with directly existentialist language that, that uh, you could make uh, the whole case on that one book if you could tolerate it, meaning it's dense, it's, it's difficult, it's heavy. Um, but what we'll do is we'll turn a little bit to, to, uh, to that book. And um, so what I want to do here um, is take just a line almost at random, certainly one that's related to our topic, however. And Shabastari says, um, if you become trapped in yourself, the world will at once become your veil. If you become trapped in yourself, the world will at once become your veil. And Lahiji, 
commentator writing um, a couple hundred years later, roughly speaking. Lahiji says, in other words, since the human reality is the model of the whole world, any time that the human becomes trapped in the veil of illusory selfhood, he or she becomes trapped in the whole world's veil. Whenever a person escapes the illusion of selfhood, there is no other veil in front of him or her. The source of all sin and suffering is narcissism. Imagining the separateness of one's own existence is what leads to imagining the separateness of the world's existence. Imagining the separateness of one's own existence is what leads to imagining the separateness of the world's existence. So he's, he's uh, tackling here the issue of, um, of the human being coming up in this world, in the world of the senses and uh, object relations, objectification of the other and the self, and that simply becomes more entrenched as the human matures. And um, let us recall that um, from the point of view of um, the scripture, the scripture is always right there for the Sufi teachers. They've never for a moment abandoned the Muslim scripture. They're using it. They're thinking about this across, across these contexts. And in the case of the, the, um, of the Quran, you have the, the, the statement, Rana ala qulubihim imma yaksibun. So there's, there's a, a vertigris upon their hearts from what they have been accumulating. In this particular verse, the, the idea is, is, uh, is not so much what they've done, which is in other verses. In this one, yaksibun kasp kardan. So kasp to acquire. There's a, in other words, there's a piling up. There's an accumulation upon the, the primordial awareness and just think back for a moment to Rumi's issue with the mirror and realize that Rumi was interested in this because of this verse, among other things. He was very aware that uh, there are this and other verses in the Quran that are stating very explicitly how this process of um, blindness through objectification, blindness through self-reference. And so at this point, let us remember that the Sufi existentialist, the impersonal existentialist, is not anti-personal. 